What I'm doing here is I'm drawing an immunoglobulin type M. And we've got a central bit and then we've got five units, one, two, three, four, coming from it. And these antibodies are a bit like your own body. There's a central bit and they've got two arms. And there's a grippy bit on the end of each arm as well. So coming out of each of these, we've got the Y-shaped molecule like this. Complicated protein structure, the immunoglobulin. We normally abbreviate to uh, antibody. So this is an antibody. Now the thing about antibodies is they are specific. And the end of the antibody is a specific shape like this to interact with a particular antigenic molecule. And the one we've drawn here is a anti-A antibody. Now if this is an anti-A antibody, what group blood is this going to be? Well, if there's anti-A antibodies, this person is going to be blood group B. So they've got anti-A antibodies here in the plasma. That's anti-A's. And this person is blood group B, and it is the red cells that determine the blood group. So here are the B, and we've drawn these as circular the B antigens on the surface of this red cell. And I think we can obviously see that what we've diagram diagrammatically drawn as a semicircle here representing the B antigen won't neatly fit in to the anti-A receptor site. It won't fit. That's rounded. That's triangular, so it won't fit. And that's fine, because this person is blood group B, as determined by the red cell. But if this person who's blood group B needs to receive a blood transfusion, and that may well happen, because if this person loses a lot of blood, for example, it's going to be necessary to oxygenate their tissues and to maintain their blood pressure. Now, maintaining blood pressure is not too hard in someone who's been bleeding, because you can put in fluids, different types of fluids. You might put in a ringer's lactate type Hartman solution, for example, to replenish the intravascular volume, and that can put the blood pressure back up. But if you add a lot of intravenous fluids, crystalloid fluids, that's going to dilute the red cells and this person's already lost red cells. So that means the oxygen carrying capacity of their blood is going to be reduced. And sometimes to increase the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood, to prevent tissue hypoxia, we have to give blood transfusions. There is no other way. We have to give blood transfusions. Because about one to 1.5% 1 of the oxygen carried in the blood is carried in solution in the plasma. The other 99% or 98.5% is carried in the form of oxyhemoglobin associated with the hemoglobin molecules, which of course are only found in the erythrocytes in the red cells. So sometimes it's necessary to give additional red cells in blood transfusions. Or some patients might be very anemic and they're so anemic it's causing complications and we need to replenish the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood rapidly and give them a blood transfusion. Now in that case we mustn't give them the wrong group of blood because if we do we get a transfusion mismatch reaction and let's look at one way in which that can occur now. So suppose we've made a mistake and we've given this person who is blood group B, suppose we give them blood group A by mistake. That means we're introducing A erythrocytes 
A red cells into this person who is blood group B. And on the surface of the A erythrocytes, on the surface of the A red cells, of course, there are the A antigens. That's what makes it blood group A. So there we have A antigens on the surface of the red cell. And we've introduced these as a donor's blood, but we've got it wrong and we've given blood group A by mistake. Now, what we notice is that these antigens on the surface of the A red cell are just the right shape to fit into the receptor sites here of these A antibodies, which are naturally occurring in the group B blood. So in group B blood, there are naturally occurring anti-A antibodies, the immunoglobulin. So when the red cell gets anywhere close to the immunoglobulin, because it's got the A antigens on its surface, they're going to fit in quite neatly into this site. So if we look up a blow-up diagram of this, here's the end of the immunoglobulin. Here is the red cell. And this is a group A red cell. This is an A, this is an anti-A antibody. And on the surface of the A red cell, we have these A antigens. And we can see that fits perfectly into the A antibody. And once that has fitted into there, that is going to grab it and not let go. That's going to form a secure bond. And I think you can see that because of the nature of this antibody, red cells from all round about, all of the donated A red cells, and of course all of the donated A red cells are going to express the A antigen, that's going to bind with the A antibody. And I think it's quite obvious to see that you're going to get lots and lots of A red cells all clumping together, being held together by this antibody. And of course, there's going to be antigens all over the surface of the red cell, and another antibody can latch onto that. So what we can end up with is a huge clump of the donated red cells. So the donated red cells will be agglutinated, all stuck together, forming little clumps by the recipient's A antibodies. So we can see that if we give group A blood to someone who is blood group B, we're going to get agglutination of the donated red cells as they are agglutinated or clumped together by the A antibodies in the recipient's plasma. This is going to stimulate immunological, sometimes complement mediated reactions. This is going to break up these red cells causing what we call a hemolytic reaction. So initially there's going to be the agglutination, they're all going to get clumped together, and then there's going to be hemolysis, hemoblood lysis to break up, to break up the red cells. And that can release free hemoglobin into the blood, causing a hemolytic mismatch reaction. So our haematology labs are very good, but there can be a clerical error 
things can go wrong in the process. So when patients are getting blood transfusions, we have to observe them closely for possible hemolytic mismatch reactions. These can occur within or a minute of giving the blood. They can occur almost instantaneously, but they can be delayed for up to 24 hours. So your clinical observations are absolutely essential during blood transfusions to make sure this doesn't happen. But of course, of course, we must do the patient no harm. Now, early on in these reactions, there might be fever, hypotension, wheezing, anxiety, and flank pain, possibly coming from the kidneys, or probably coming from the kidneys. And the haemoglobin from the haemolyzed red cells can be excreted into the urine, potentially causing renal failure, but initially causing haemoglobin in the urine, making the urine look a red colour. And later on, this can develop into disseminated intravascular coagulation, the DIC condition with bleeding and multiple hemorrhages, hypotension, and indeed it can become a life-threatening condition. So if it is going to occur, spot it as early as possible, and of course, take senior review, and of course, stop the transfusion as quickly as possible. Now, as well as hemolytic transfusion mismatch reactions, there's other possible complications of blood transfusions, allergic reactions, transfusion-related lung injury, where there might be shortness of breath, reduced oxygen saturations and lung crepitations. There could be bacteriological contamination. But this diagram illustrates the possibility of the hemolytic agglutination and transfusion mismatch result, resulting in, uh, in hemolysis. And this is why it happens. Because the, in this case, the A antibodies are going to agglutinate the donated A, group A erythrocytes that have been mistakenly transfused. Just make sure it doesn't happen on your watch.